work for uh, Polar Aspect. Um, and I, I'm here to talk uh, to you a bit today about the Arctic, uh, indigenous peoples of the Arctic, and how they are you know, represented uh, internationally and how you can be involved and learn more about through Model Arctic Council. So um, we'll, we'll jump straight into it. I'll try and be efficient with, with the time. Um, the first thing I'd like you to do, please, is you know, just close your eyes and picture, picture the Arctic. What do you see? What can you feel? Perhaps what can you hear or smell? Just conjure up an image of the Arctic in your mind. Take a you know, couple of seconds, transport yourself figuratively to the Arctic, see and so perhaps if you open your eyes again now, perhaps you imagined this. I'm sure that's what most people imagine. Uh, this sort of untouched natural beauty. Uh, this is the, the coast of Svalbard up in Norway. A very, very picturesque land. Um, and this is what a lot of people think of when they picture the Arctic. But perhaps you picture this instead. And this is just off the coast of Greenland. Um, and this is the Can Energy uh, drilling rig. It's a mobile rig that moves around to different locations. And for the last few years, it's been off the coast of Greenland, uh, drilling for oil. Um, perhaps, however, you pictured this, and this is a, a weird image of the Arctic that many people don't realise or think about. This is a shopping centre, a big shopping mall uh, in Greenland. Um, and this is quite a weird image. Um, if you compare that to the coast of Svalbard. Um, but, you know, these are ordinary people going around ordinary days with, you know, their cafes and their clothes shops, um, well, well within the Arctic Circle. Um, what about this image? The, the Arctic less as a physical place, but more of a canary in the coal mine, if you like, for climate change. Um, the map on the left is showing the global increase of temperatures over the past 60 or so years. And I think the graph on the right is really interesting. Um, the increase or decrease in the increase in temperatures going up the graph, but then along the bottom, it's actually latitude. So right on the far right hand side of the graph is the highest latitude. So the Arctic Circle. Um, and you can see it really puts in perspective how much more the Arctic's warming uh, and has warmed over the last 50 years compared to the rest of the, the, rest of the world. And yeah, some of you may have thought of this when you picture the Arctic. This is um, in Nunavut in Canada, uh, the Canadian Arctic. And these are local Inuit people protesting the really high cost of food. Um, part of the reason the cost of food is so high is there's no roads going out to their community. So all food and uh, milk and whatever has to be flown in. So these give lots of really different images of the Arctic. And whilst at first you might just picture, you know, a, nor uh, sorry, a polar bear on the picturesque coast of uh, Svalbard, uh, there's lots of different aspects to the Arctic. And, you know, there's not one Arctic, hopefully, I've shown you. There's lots of different overlapping Arctics. Some are this beautiful wilderness, some are uh, almost a treasure trove of natural resources, some are a frontier, and others, a lot of places in the Arctic, are homes, are where people live and work and go about their daily lives. Um, uh, this map just shows the different it, definitions of the Arctic. Um, and the, the lines they draw. So, you know, there's not even one Arctic circle. Um, it depends on what definition you use and how you draw the line. So we, we hear a lot of narratives in popular Western culture about the Arctic. 
And a lot of it's informed by the fact that we probably don't really appreciate how diverse life in the Arctic is. We generally just imagine that first image, um, the, the untouched coast, the, the wilderness of the Arctic. And that's led to a lot of uh, narratives, some which are potentially quite damaging because they ignore the people who actually live there and what's actually going on in the Arctic. So Western culture might give the Arctic a certain fragility, um, uh, something that's very prone to climate change and is breaking and is, is you know, going to shatter and very fragile. Um, something that really ought to be protected and we need a concerted world effort to protect. Um, or perhaps a, a place where heroes go on great adventures and human limits can be tested and pushed their extreme and nature itself can be conquered. Um, and these are pictures of Arctic explorers from the uh, 19th century. Um, and yeah, Western narratives tell of these heroic stories of these explorers. Um, or perhaps Western narratives of the Arctic as a very inhospitable, unforgiving place where only dangerous animals and dangerous animal-like people live. Um, and you know, these are old films which depict that sort of a narrative of uh, Western men going up against the, the savages of the Arctic. Or, yeah, there, there's a narrative that, that the Arctic is a, a treasure trove, a treasure trove of natural resources that are, is just sitting there waiting to be tapped into and exploited. Um, or the narrative of it being a certain sort of no man's land ready to be claimed by all these European and North American uh, imperial powers. Or as perhaps a military, uh, military frontier where two nuclear armed powers stand off against each other. Or somewhere where a, a morality play can be acted out, where people can make points about climate change and you know, show the, the dramatic effects and grandstand. And it, it says, look carefully at this photograph here. I'll, I'll give you a couple of seconds to, to just have a good look at the photograph, the polar bear in the bottom. Uh, see if you notice anything odd about it. Um, it's it's photoshops and you, you can tell the the shadows and the reflections in the wolf that they're all wrong um, it, it's a photoshopped image but it's a very striking and uh, a famous image if not this image itself the, the concept of this image a, a polar bear lost floating away on a small iceberg um, just drifting out to its death it's a it's a photoshopped image. It's made up. In. It's good publicity for the idea of a flight fight against climate change and something that needs protecting or preventing. But it, it's totally made up. This image. So yeah, we have all these Arctic imaginaries. What we imagine the Arctic to be like, and the, the narratives in Western culture that we have. The, but one thing you may have noticed as I was going through all of those, um, they're devoid of any people that live there, or if there are any there, they're uh, made out to be these savage people um, who, who must be fought against. Um, so we have the, these ideas and these narratives of the Arctic, but they don't Betray what's truly there. There exists a human Arctic. Um, in fact, it could be argued there exists many different human Arctics. There's many different peoples of many different uh, backgrounds and cultures that live within the Arctic. Um, uh, you may be surprised to learn that well over four million people live live in the Arctic. These, these this is data taken from 2004. So add on, what, 17 years now, 
um, it's well over four million people. Um, interesting to note the, the little pie charts on each of the countries on the left hand side. In both Canada and Greenland, uh, the proportion of indigenous people that live in the, the Arctic in those territories uh, is greater than the proportion of non-indigenous people. So and that's, that's something we're going to go on to talk about a lot today, this idea of these indigenous peoples and how they're represented and who's looking out for them. Yeah, well over four million people now live in the Arctic and call the Arctic home. Um, and especially when we're talking about the indigenous people, there's not just one set of indigenous people, there's hundreds of different indigenous cultures and communities. And you know, for ease of uh, international diplomacy and things like that, they're often grouped together into these six groups, but even takes a ripe on the Russian Association of Indigenous Peoples of the North. That represents almost 200 different individual communities um, under one big group. So the, there are the, the variation between even different indigenous groups in the Arctic is, is there, there's so many of them. And as this homeland for these people, the Arctic's a place where social and economic development really matters. Um, this is the mayor of the hamlet of Clyde River um, holding up a, a sign saying save the Arctic is my home and this isn't just save the Arctic from climate change this, this man lives here and yeah destroying the Arctic isn't just destroying a wonderful place for him it's destroying his, his home his life his community, his history. Ooh. And yeah, as with any group of people living anywhere, they have their concerns. And um, yeah, you will see climate change, environmental policy is high on that. But there are other factors that are great concern to people living within the Arctic. This is a, a survey of people living in Alaska and Northern Canada. You can see a disaster response and basic public infrastructure. It's really, really high on the list of things they're concerned about. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of communities and places in the Arctic you cannot get to by road, that you can only get to by air or by sea. Um, and reaching these people in disaster or even taking out the, the materials needed to build basic infrastructure is a real challenge and it's you know it makes sense that for arctic people sustainable development is a very important concern and a very important challenge they need to they need to rise to but sadly, the, the, the international community and the Western powers and the Arctic states, the states which control the territory, which we'll go on to talk a lot more about later, have, have ignored or even uh, actively worked against the, the voices and the concerns of those people living in the Arctic, um, and often with quite tragic results. Um, yeah. Russia in particular has used the Arctic to carry out nuclear tests, uh, destroying whole swathes of land used by indigenous people. Um, they, they've lived off that land for tens of thousands of years, their ancestors, and but to the Russian government it was just wilderness that they could blow up as they pleased. Um, high Arctic relocation, uh, Canada realised in kind of the the mid 20th century, that if they didn't have people living right up in the north of Canada, uh, their claim to that land as their territory was getting weaker and weaker. So what did they do? They went, oh, all these indigenous people are used to the cold and forcefully shipped them all further up north, made them settle down in permanent communities. You know, the Inuit people were used to 
um, moving around the land with the seasons and as throughout the year. And they made them settle down in these permanent communities, forcing them up north, or well away from their traditional hunting ground, so that the Canadian government could claim claim that territory and have a, a good claim on it. And then the bottom uh, the bottom uh, bottom photo, sorry, is the Greenpeace protest against sealing a protest over the, the seal hunt and the ban of uh, seal fur, and that's something. We're going to talk a little bit more now because um, it's a very tragic case study. I, I'll give a quick warning. There's a couple of photos that are coming up that um, are perhaps slightly more gory. I'll give another warning just before I show them. Um, you feel free to look away. Um, I won't linger on them for too long. But it's important for me uh, a context of exploring. The, the history and exploring the problems facing this part of the world today, I think it's really important that we uh, do uh, assess, assess the, the sorry tale of the seal hunt face on and you know, not beat around the bush a bit. So I'll give another warning just before I show them. And you know, if, if it's not for you, feel free to look away. I won't link for you. So, Historically, um, the Inuit hunt uh, have hunted seals, um, have hunted the seal, or what they call uh, Nazi, uh, and they inhabit the Arctic all year round. And uh, the, the Inuit peoples have traditionally hunted uh, for the meat, the fur, and you can use the, the blubber, the fat of the seal, for, as a really good fuel source. Um, a very important thing to note here is uh, local, uh, Inuit hunting of seal has always been a very sustainable enterprise. Uh, each year, seal, no more seals are killed than are born. Populations have, have increased year on year, and you know, Inuit have been hunting seal for tens of thousands of years. Um, so, you know, this is not something that was wiping out the seal population and it was a very not just a a important part of uh you know staying alive for these people you know the, the fur can be used for really warm clothing against the harsh arctic winter uh obviously the food and uh, the fuel source so hunting seal was very important both uh, you know, in terms of natural stuff it was also a very traditional way of life and it was a way of tradition being passed down through generation to generation and hunting seal is inseparable from the sense of belonging and the sense of being in India. Um, but from the 1950s to the 1970s, uh, excuse me, the Canadian government forced the Inuit people to move further north away from their traditional hunting grounds and settle down into these permanent, permanent villages. And this really separated the uh, Inuit from their hunting grounds. And as a result, hunting now required modern technology, a modern piece of kit. You could no longer walk to the hunting ground. You had to a snowmobile for hundreds of miles potentially and modern technology uh, a snowmobile and then all the fuels go into it the repairs etc um, um guns and bullets these all required a lot of money so as as a result of the forceful separation of the inuit from their traditional hunting grounds uh, the cost of carrying out their traditional lifestyle uh, and what was very necessary for their survival increased massively. Now, in 1961, a Norwegian process for tanning seal pelts was invented. And what this led to was a rise in demand for seal fur of all different species of seals. Um, it became somewhat of a, a fashion thing in the 1960s. And demand for seal furs shot up almost overnight. 
And so suddenly you've got uh, these, this massive increase in costs of carrying out the hunt, but now a massive demand for the seal fur, which often was uh, surplus to the Inuit's requirements. They used some for uh, clothing and stuff, but they needed more seals for food and fuel than they needed for uh, clothing. So you had excess seal fur anyway. So uh, suddenly you, you can see a, a solution. Um, the Inuit could sell on the seal fur that they collected. And it was, it's been estimated that a single seal coat would pay for a whole day's hunt. So the fuel, the bullets, the repairs for the wear and tear on equipment, um, all of that could be paid for just by selling one seal fur. Um, yeah, and, and ring seal, which the Inuit hunt enabled the Inuit to earn money from their traditional hunts. Their way of living was suddenly earning them a lot of money. Um, just a heads up, uh, the next, next photo does contain a little bit of bad language. It just says it on the photo. I won't read it out, but if that offends you, feel free to look away. Um, but the hunt of white coat seals for luxury fur uh, became denounced as inhumane slaughter. Um, and as this, this clip from television shows, um, they want to kill some, they want that they kill them because some people want to wear fur coats. And it, it was this white fur of the, the white coat seals that was of particular, was of growing concern to international organizations and animal charities. Um, I'm about to move on to the next slide. The next slide does show some dead seals. If that's something you don't want to see, look away now, I won't linger for long. And so the Norwegians had invented this tool for hunting white coats and pictures of it seemed cruel and repellent, especially these, you know, these images of the juxtaposed red blood on the white snow. Um, and you know, there was growing international concern and outrage at this. And so in 1983, the European Union voted to ban the import of seal fur. It was now illegal to sell, and to this day remains illegal to sell seal fur within the European Union. And overnight, the Inuit, uh, the Inuit economy crashed essentially, they lost 60% of their income pretty much overnight because suddenly you could not, there was such little demand now for these the seal fur, what little demand there was left, the price crashed and they lost a whole market in which they could sell, again, what are the offcuts of a traditional hunt done in a very uh, sustainable way because of a different industrial hunt which they were not involved in at all and the knock-on effect of that was uh, huge poverty to this day there remains huge poverty and um, i said before one ring seal fur would pay for a whole day's hunt after after the 1983 ban one seal fur would not even buy a box of bullets so you, you can see the the massive shift uh, almost overnight that impoverished a lot of these communities um, led to yeah, lots of starvation, um, massively increased suicide rate, which persists to this day in a lot of Inuit communities. And you know, to this day, this ban has been catastrophic. Um, in 1986, the Canadian government uh, a lot of Inuits live in Canada, and the Canadian government opened up an inquiry, a royal uh, commission to look into this. And when Greenpeace, the environmental charity, were asked to give evidence, they stood up and proclaimed that the Inuit should drop, should adopt a more traditional lifestyle. Uh, Greenpeace believed that the Inuit should go out hunting with bows and arrows rather than snowmobiles and guns. And if you remember from earlier, 
it's not the Inuit's fault they could no longer hunt with bows and arrows. It was the decisions of the Canadian government and other uh, external forces that forced them away from their traditional hunting ground. And because of that, uh, they now are reliant on this sort of modern technology. And um, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, where uh, Inuit voices are not only not being listened to, but the Inuit are being told, being, it's being prescribed to them how they should live their lifestyle by, uh, by the West. Um, and so the, my question for you is, what narratives, what imaginaries enabled or justified treating the Inuit as the collateral damage uh, to protect the sea? Uh, who, who was being protected and from what, at what cost? Um, and that's something to think about. So yeah, from the perspective of some Arctic people, these narratives actually discount them, ignore them. Um, and yeah, what Greenpeace and other organisations think is, is saving the Arctic is not actually saving those people that live there. It's having the opposite effect. It seems to some Arctic people that saving the Arctic means saving the Arctic people from themselves. Excellent. Um, so what, what is being done now to ensure that indigenous peoples have 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 a quality have and can be heard indigenous voices can be heard and listened to and we'll talk about it in the arctic but yeah it, this is uh, a worldwide issue so if if you look briefly at this map of the arctic this is just a political map of the arctic you'll see that there's no mention of any indigenous peoples any there's simply the eight Arctic states, uh, the United States, Canada, uh, Denmark, which represent Greenland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. Um, and it's essentially, it becomes assumed that, well, the indigenous peoples live within the borders of these states. Uh, these states will look out for their interests. But that certainly has not always been the case historically. Not only, you know, we talked about the seals a second ago, but, um, in recent months, it, it's been revealed further the, the amount of death of indigenous peoples caused in uh, Canadian residential schools when the Canadian government forced indigenous children away from their families into these uh, very abusive residential schools uh, in order to try and westernize them. And um, here's a photo of Justin Trudeau uh, issuing an apology on behalf of the Canadian government for, for them. But hundreds of children have died in these really abusive residential homes. So historically, it certainly doesn't seem to be the case that the Arctic states have always had indigenous people's interests at heart. And it's been argued that today is the same still happens. Um, this is a, a new story from 2019 uh, claiming that, you know, Indigenous peoples, uh, activists and Indigenous peoples, uh, spokespeople were being silenced and, excuse me, persecuted by the Russian government. Uh, Russia, who's meant to be representing a huge number of Indigenous peoples, on this evidence don't seem to be have, have those interests apart and you know you can understand it's hard the priorities of indigenous peoples probably differ from those of the state but it begs the question if that's the case why are the states being asked to represent the indigenous peoples why aren't the indigenous peoples representing themselves which brings us nicely on to the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council was formed in 1996. And the idea is 
it's a council where the member, the, the Arctic states can come together with uh, indigenous peoples and have a seat at the table. Um, there's eight Arctic states, there's six uh, organizations representing indigenous peoples throughout the Arctic. Um, the Aleut people, the Athabascan people, the Christian people, the Inuit, the Raipon, uh, which represents an, you know, hundreds of different uh, indigenous peoples in Russia and the Sami. And the Arctic Council has six working groups focusing on different remits of the environment, uh, the you know, development, um, and you know, various different remits. Um, and the idea is, that there are 14 seats at the table and all the, the eight Arctic states and the six indigenous organizations sit fairly with one another at the table. Um, the, the Arctic Council is unique as an international organization in a couple of ways. Not only are the indigenous peoples, so non-sovereign states, are involved at the highest level of decision making. The decisions of the Arctic Council are made by consensus. It's not a majority vote, it's a collaborative uh, and joint venture, and all decisions have to be taken by consensus. There's no, there's no way of uh, forcing through a, a majority opinion unless everyone agrees. And within the Arctic Circle, uh, there is this strong emphasis on indigenous knowledge and indigenous collaboration. A lot of the Arctic Council's projects prioritise working with indigenous people, respecting that indigenous people know, have an unrivaled knowledge of the land and the challenges uh, that they face. And uh, no problem can be really solved without the full collaboration of those indigenous people. Uh, this quote at the bottom is taken from an uh, Arctic Council project called uh, One Health. And uh, it says inclusion of local communities and indigenous peoples is especially important to the sector. The Arctic Council realised that there, there's no problem they can solve by ignoring the indigenous voices. They have to have the indigenous voices front and centre to properly solve these issues. And the Arctic Council it is not a Arctic government. It's a forum for these group, these indigenous groups and these nations to come together to discuss, to shape policy, to decide on collective ways forward. They're not making laws. And um, whilst the Arctic Council has been used as a as a kind of venue to uh, negotiate and sign legally binding treaties. That's not its main purpose. Um, the Arctic Council the, 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 the highest, at the highest level meets every couple of years and they, they decide on joint policies that they undertake. Again, it's by consensus. No one's being forced to do anything. But they, they decide jointly how they want to tackle problems. Um, and between each of these these meetings, uh, there's loads and loads of work going on in the back. And uh, this work focuses on kind of the five main areas, um, agreements and cooperation, uh, gathering data and research, uh, monitoring things to see what's going on, whether it be environment or shipping or weather, um, assessing different uh, risks and, uh, and kind of taking all of this together and putting recommendations before the Arctic states and the, the indigenous people. Um, and the Arctic Council has, has undoubtedly contributed greatly to uh, Arctic knowledge and uh, yeah, diplomatic success. Um, this is just a selection of the huge, huge range of uh, policies and um, declarations and reports that have been published and adopted by the Arctic Council. Um, and like I said, a couple of treaties have been negotiated primarily through the Arctic Council. Uh, 
the Arctic Council has undoubtedly been a huge diplomatic success. And you know, this slide just shows the, the variety of different projects that the Arctic Council is involved in, from you know, litter to health uh, to waste management to contaminants and microplastics, and mercury, uh, permafrost, so many different uh, projects the Arctic Council is involved in as a forum for bringing people together to cooperate and achieve solutions. However, and you knew there was going to be a however, however, this is not full equity for Indigenous people. And there's two key clauses in the Ottawa Declaration, the declaration that set up the Arctic Council. Uh, the first is Article 7. Decisions of the Arctic Council are to be by consensus of the members. This is just consensus of the eight Arctic states. Uh, whilst the Arctic Council strives for full consensus and it hopes that the Indigenous Peoples Associations will also agree and, uh, you yeah, know, join in a full consensus. If need be, the, the Arctic Council will pass, de will pass declarations without the consent of the Indigenous people. It only requires the eight nations to agree to something for it to be adopted in the declaration. And Article 2 here, which says the number of permanent participants should at any time be less than the number of members, are less than the number of nations. The Arctic is kind of capped at eight nations. There's not really, we're not going to suddenly invent another nation in the Arctic. So, and as, as I alluded to earlier, there's the Indigenous Peoples Organisations represent, each of them represent a variety, a, a wide range of different Indigenous peoples with different views and different concerns. And, you know, this, this seemingly arbitrary cap is, is there totally on purpose so that uh, the, the Arctic nations, the, the countries, uh, maintain their sovereignty, maintain the fact that diplomacy globally is done by nations, by countries, it's not done by peoples. And yet, this idea is very problematic with the Arctic, not only to that where people live and the different peoples not line up with national borders, national borders cut through them. But also, whichever definition, I showed you a number of definitions of the Arctic earlier, but whichever definition you draw the Arctic Circle, it cuts through every single Arctic nation. Uh, every single country, Canada, the USA, Russia, has some of its territory in the Arctic and some of its territory outside the Arctic. However you draw that line, all the countries have territory outside the Arctic. All the countries have their capital outside the Arctic. Their decision-making centre is outside the Arctic. It's very removed from the Arctic. The Arctic is a place where nation states don't really work. They've been enforced upon it by imperialism. Um, and so there truly is not, there's not true equality here. Uh, the indigenous, indigenous peoples of the Arctic cannot, uh, are not on a level pegging with the, the nations and the sub-Arctic regions just yet. It is important to say though that in a lot of regards the Arctic as a region is light years ahead of the rest of the world. Um, in many, many parts of the world, Indigenous peoples have no voice whatsoever to this day. The fact that uh, the Indigenous peoples of the Arctic have, have a voice at the table, have their opinions and their concerns listened to, even if they can eventually be ignored and vetoed, uh, the fact that their voice and concerns are listened to, as it is at the moment, is well ahead of most other Indigenous populations throughout the world. Um, if you think to Native Americans in America or um, the Aboriginal people in Australia, they have much, much less of, 
got a seat at the table than the Arctic Indigenous people. So, which brings me nicely on, and I seem to be doing all right time-wise. So it brings me nicely on to um, how can you get involved? And Polar Aspect, the company I work for, uh, there, there's many, many ways you can get involved with us, and particularly through Model Arctic Council. I imagine most of you, if not all of you, have done Model United Nations, um, or uh, I hope are very keen and very enjoying it. Model Arctic Council is a similar concept. It's, um, we, it's model diplomacy, but instead of basing it off the U UN and following their rules and procedures, we base it off the Arctic Council. And there's, a, you know, there's very interesting and very exciting differences. And I'll, I'll talk about those. Um, if you are looking to get involved, and with further aspects, I really, really hope you do. I'd love to, love to see you at our various conferences. We do uh, essentially four conferences throughout the year for secondary school pupils. Uh, Normac and Wickermac in the United Kingdom, uh, Collegio at uh, Mac Bilbao, Collegio Ayaude in Spain, and uh, as of last year, we do an online conference. Uh, this year's conference is going to be in December of this year. And it'd be really, really great to see, to see lots of people there. Um, this is, we, we try to make it as realistic as possible. On the left is a picture from our NORMAC a couple of years ago. On the right, a meeting of the senior Arctic officials of the Arctic Council the year before. Um, you can see the striking similarities. We really strive for as much realism as possible. And as if you take part in a model Arctic Council, you will play the role of an Arctic diplomat, perhaps one of the Arctic states, perhaps one of the indigenous peoples um, in what is hopefully a dynamic and very enjoyable simulation of how the Arctic Council works. Um, MAC differs from any sort of MUN you might have ever done before. And it does so in order to reflect kind of the uniqueness and the, the different style of the Arctic Council. All decisions of, uh, at a MAC are done by consensus. Um, whether it's procedural, whether, you know, we're going to go for a break now, or we're going to look at this issue or that issue, or voting on the actual declaration itself. Everything is done by consensus. Uh, there's no option for a majority vote if there's no consensus. It's kind of an all or nothing thing. Um, everything's done very collaboratively. All the declarations are drafted together. Nothing comes pre-prepared. There's no lobbying. Um, but a lot of it's also very informal. At any point, um, often many times throughout a conference, everybody leaves the formal meeting and goes and chats and works collaboratively in the corridor or outside and to, to work through the different issues. Um, indigenous peoples and rights, this is, you know, unless, uh, you know, there, there's small parts of the United Nations which pay a little bit to this, but indigenous peoples are front and center. They all have a seat at the table at in the real Arctic Council, they all have a seat at the table in MAC. Um, you, uh, one of the challenges in MAC is negotiating not only with other nations, but with indigenous peoples with their own unique perspective and concerns on issues. Um, and, you know, it's very, very helpful in learning about how issues affect indigenous peoples rather than just uh, nation states. And finally, the focus, it's not only is it a very small conference, there's only uh, 14 delegations, often played, often with two or three delegates per delegation um, to split the workload, but there's a very thematic focus on just the Arctic. We're dealing in depth on quite an, you know, on the, the, these issues on a smaller scale and um, you, you learn very well in depth on, on that. 
Um, we've had loads and loads of really good feedback. Um, everyone that's done it has loved it. Um, you can head over to our website at the bottom to read more uh, of our feedback and what people thought of taking part. Um, I'll quickly run through our online stuff. Um, yeah, we're obviously online now. Uh, the idea of doing it online is so we can get people from all over the world joining. Uh, we do an online delegate training every year. So if you're new and you have no idea and want a little taster, but uh, you know some practice and some more structured walking through step by step, uh, that will take place this November across four weeks, one session a week. Um, and you can find out more by going to omac.peraspect.com forward slash training. Then in December, uh, the second weekend of December, we're hosting our second ever online conference, which we're really, really excited about. It's a full online Model Arctic Council conference across two days, um, three and a half hours each day, and the only one of its kind in the world. Uh, and we do that on Microsoft Teams, which allows for really good, both formal in the meeting together, chatting together, and informal, whether texting or in small groups. Um, and we, we found it's a really, really good platform, and really, really good feedback from doing that last year. If you want to learn more about that, go to omac.peraspect.com forward slash conference. And to register for both, registration is now open for both of them. And please, 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 we'd love to see you there. We'd love you to sign up. Go to omac.peraspect.com forward slash register. I think the admins are going to put those links in the chat as well, if that's easier for you guys to click on to. So um, thank you ever so much for listening. I hope I haven't been too dull. Um, I'm, I'll am i hang around for a bit. I'd love to answer any questions you have, whether it's about uh, Model Arctic Council or any of the issues I've discussed today, or just the Arctic more widely. I'll do my best to answer any questions you have. So thank you ever so much. Joshua, we did have a question come in. Um, it goes like this. How can non-Arctic group countries help with their degradation in the Arctic and why should they put their energy and resources in doing so? Also, how can youth awareness in Asian countries through MAC help the cause? Um, so, so in answer to the, the first bit of the question, um, yeah, whilst the Arctic is obviously a home for those that live there, as I mentioned quite early on, um, you know, it, it's also a natural resource and a, a beautiful place and obviously suffering a lot from climate change. And, uh, you know, in, in a lot of regards, especially with things like climate change measures that affect the rest of the world will also probably disproportionately benefit the Arctic as well. So, um, Certainly, whilst the Arctic Council and MAC tends to have an Arctic focus, the Arctic doesn't exist in isolation. Um, the Arctic exists as a part of a part of the wider world. Um, sorry, remind me what the second part of that question was. Uh, why should countries uh, do so? And how can youth awareness in Asian countries help the cause? Um, so, yeah, like I say, uh, you should do so because not only is the Arctic amazing in and of itself, but it's intrinsically connected to the rest of the world through shipping and through climate and through trade and diplomacy. It, it, it's all very connected. Um, how can youth activism and youth knowledge and getting engaged help if you're in Asia or Europe or America, wherever you are in the world, having awareness about these issues as you move up and perhaps go into government or uh, you know, international organizations, charities, diplomacy, with, with all of these different range, even into if you're going into business and dealing with international business, having a knowledge of the Arctic and uh, uh, you know, have it, 
or keeping it in the back of your mind and having the respect for it and being able to let others know and factor Arctic and those issues into your thinking is really beneficial. And, you know, you can, the world is becoming increasingly closer connected. You can make a change from anywhere in the world. And it only takes a few voices to start standing up and saying, this is wrong, we ought to do it this other way instead. And you can affect a lot of change across the world. I'd also say, you know, I've obviously talked about the, 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 the Arctic today, but the issues, especially the issues with representing and hearing Indigenous voices, they span all over the world, every single continent. Um, indigenous voices everywhere need to be better listened to. So, um, and generally voices of those that are less well heard, you know, lots of different groups have lots to add to our society and our world and yeah the lessons from the arctic and learning about the arctic can be applied to everywhere else thank you for that also if everyone can turn on your video during the q a session that would be great so we have another question so firstly um the person starts with saying that this insight and the cry from arctic needs more views since the person didn't know about this gruesome situation as they're from kuwait and it's like um all the way across the globe so they want to know what can they do since they're literally halfway through the globe like away from arctic to save the living animals and sustainability of the place and its people and there's a second part of the question as to how can they make sure that the voices are heard and they're not modernized enough to destroy their land. So, um, first of all, again, it goes back to what I was just saying. Uh, yeah, there's our world is becoming increasingly, increasingly connected. Distance is becoming less and less real in a sense. Um, yeah, and especially as people, yeah, you can affect the other side of the world with from even if you're not going into politics whatever you can affect it by what you purchase how you choose to live your life um there, there are plenty of different ways to uh you know benefit the arctic and and vice versa um people up in the arctic there's plenty of ways for them to benefit the rest of the world by buying sustainable products and um speaking out and helping educate other people um so yeah that there, there's you know i'm talking to people from all over the world here distance is becoming less and less real there's there's plenty of ways you can you can connect um sorry remind me the second part of the question yeah definitely um, so they want to know how can they make sure that the voices are heard and they're not modernized enough to destroy their um, land? Um, so I, the, the issue of, of raising up and hearing uh, Indigenous voices is, is a tricky one. I, yeah, I think generally around the world, um, we need to lobby and petition and um, ask for you know, Indigenous people to be more included at the highest level at decision making levels. Um, whether it's in forums like the Arctic Council, whether it's giving Indigenous people seats in uh, a government like the, the US government or the Australian government, or, you know, it giving them seats in federal government and local government, uh, representing them better in uh, communities like the United Nations. Um, yeah, you know, within Indigenous communities, there's plenty of people that are willing to represent them and their interests. And it's about giving them the platform to do so. Thank you so much. If anyone else has any questions, you can type them down in the chat.
Mm -hmm. there are no more questions. Are we ready to conclude the presentation? Unless, Joshua, you have anything else to add on? No. It just okay. thank you so much for coming. Thank you for listening. And, you know, um, the links are in the chat. If you'd like to find out more or, or sign up, um, please, please do. Um, and the emails, I'll put our email in the chat as well. Feel free to, to drop us an email if, if you have any questions or want to talk about anything anymore. Um, I'm going to turn on the video so we could take a screenshot for this particular session if you're comfortable, comfortable enough in doing. That would be really helpful. So we're just gonna give it a minute and then take a screenshot. But while we're doing that, um, the links for the help desk and the social are in, in the chat. If you have any questions about the summit or any of the Muni programs, you can hop into the help desk and there are Muni leaders there who will answer all your questions. And as for the summit, we hope you're enjoying it so far. We have more sessions today and then we have two more days of summit left. So I'm gonna quickly take a screenshot so everyone can give me their best poses. We're going to take one more just in case. Thank you so Okay, wait, one more person turn on the video. So thank you so much, Joshua. And thank you to all the participants for coming. This was a great session. Angela, do you want to add on anything? No, uh, I really wish you all would show up for the other sessions as well. And uh, Joshua, I really want to thank you. It was such an amazing presentation. Thank you, everyone. I um, hope, to, hope to see you at uh, Model Arctic Council soon. Right, so I will be ending the session for everyone, but thank you so much for joining. Um, this session would be also on YouTube in case you want to look back at it again in the future. It's Man Impact on YouTube. Thank you so much for joining. Have a great day ahead. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.